This month, we're going to start back with God's love. It's just as I said Tuesday night. You have to know that God loves you. Hallelujah. And so that's what our, our th topic is going to be for the rest of this month of June is about God's love. And, you know, to, 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 the Bible says that faith comes by hearing. And when someone loves you, the first thing they're going to tell you is that they love you. Okay, so we're going to listen. We have to listen to love. Amen. Revelation 3.22 tells us, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Now, you know, the thing about God's love is that it's, it's incredible because usually we, we have some, we have some uh, criteria before we love someone. You know, we got this list. They got to look good. And we ha they got to they gotta be a nice person. But the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, God loved us. Amen. So I'm going to go to the love chapter that we always read during weddings. And we're just going to go through this a little bit to establish a little bit about love. It's 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, love suffereth long and is kind. Uh, 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 charity, love envieth not. I'm just going to put the word love because charity is the 16th century. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And I, I put some things there, some, some things about um, communication because for there to be love, there also has to be a communication. It can't be a, a, a one-way thing, you know? And it says, listen without interrupting, share without pretending, speak without accusing, enjoy without complaint, give without sparing, trust without wavering, Pray without ceasing. Forgive without punishing. That's a hard one. <laughs> Answer without arguing. Promise without forgetting. Ooh. <laughs> There's some stuff to live up to, isn't it? <laughs> There's some stuff to live up to. Now, we're not streaming the Sunday school right now, but we will be putting it up the next day. The reason is, I want people to come to Sunday school. Amen. So, if you want to hear the Sunday school live, you'll have, to, you'll have to come out to Sunday school. Amen. Amen. You know, some of these principles is what we really should be striving for. It's, it's called the purest love. But what is the foundation of love? Where does love begin? Where does love begin? Well, let's read, read John 17. This is Jesus' prayer before he, he goes to the cross. He says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. You know, uh, on, a, on a wedding day, the bride is the star, right? She's all dressed up in this expensive white dress, and she is the queen. She is the, 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 the main attraction for the day when, when, it, when it's the wedding day. That's the, that's the day when that one woman is the, supposed to be the center of attraction. And Jesus is speaking about his bride. He's saying, listen, I've given her the glory which thou gavest me. I've given them, and they, they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. We're going to look at the foundation of love. What, what triggers love? Well, you know, I can just speak for myself. And, um, what triggered my love was just, because when I saw my wife at first, I thought she was older than me. So that was a that was a, a turnoff right there because I was about 17 or 18 when I first met her. And I remember her coming down the aisles of the church. I was at the bottom of the aisle and I was, uh, I was going to be um, 
her sister had asked me to fix her guitar. So she was, after church, I went to her church, and I saw this slim, tall, looked tall to me, lady coming down. And I thought, oh, this, this, this lady is probably 21 or something like that. And, and yes, yeah, she looked okay, but it didn't hit me yet, you know, didn't, I didn't have an instant thing. So we, we talked, and uh, I found out a little bit about it. Then uh, my buddy and I, who were there, uh, we had a little gospel group. So I said, hey, why don't you come? Uh, since you play a little bit, why don't you come and have a jam session with us and we'll get together. And then when she first sang, <laughs> that was it. That's what, it, that, that's what suddenly, I, I, I remember the time we both looked at each other, my buddy and myself. She wasn't really paying any attention to us, but I looked at him and he looked at me like, okay. <laughs> Because if you think Sister Brownie can sing now, you have, you have heard nothing. Nothing to what she was when she was 18. Nothing. But what is love's found? Well, that was the trigger. I said, okay, we have to get this young lady involved in our group. <laughs> involved. <laughs> that was the word. <laughs> that was the word. <laughs> that was the word that came to mind right now. Jesus, though, loved us before we even sang, so, so to speak. The Bible says from the foundation of the world. And he has given us the wedding dress to give us glory. He said, I have given them my glory that they may be one so that we can get married, so to speak. Father, verse 24, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and I will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So what is love's foundation? Well, all right, let's put physical attraction. That's part of it, right? Let's just be honest now, right? We look at someone, we say, boy, they look pretty good. But is that enough of a foundation? You know why? Because the way they look now is certainly not how they're going to look in 10 years. Physical attraction is part of it, but it, it can't really be the foundation. An attractive personality, that's certainly a big part of it, right? Um, certainly with, with Sister Brownie, I've corrupted her, but uh, when I met her, she was so innocent, unbelievably innocent. I couldn't believe there was somebody walking around that could be that, you know. <laughs> an attractive personality, an attractive per Can that be the foundation of love? No, because people can change. I've become, I've become so cynical as I've gotten older and jaded. Let me just confess. I can edit all of this out. You know, I mean, as we get older in life experiences, those things impact us, and we're going to change. So an attractive personality can't be the found, because when you think about it, we had none of those things when God loved us. That's not the foundation. What about marrying a rich guy? <laughs> I mean, that's always nice. You know, you know, a lot of people make their decision based on this because you see some old balding guy with some 20-something-year-old. You know, you, know, you know how that decision was based on. <laughs> Provision cannot be the foundation for love. No, that's, that's not really love. That's because you can provide. What about duty responsibility well that that's also part of it you know um by that i mean somebody who uh marries because they think they ought to you know or it it's it's time but truly the kind of foundation for love that i'm talking about is something that doesn't change no matter what any of those four things happen can anyone think of a of a relation a love relationship that is doesn't change even if all those four things changed. You said it, Sister Mary. A blood relationship. Right? No matter what your daughter does, she is still your daughter. 
and you still love her. Isn't that the same thing with your children? It's a blood relationship is the, is the kind of foundation that doesn't change no matter what those things change. It's a blood relationship. And that's the relationship that God wants with us so that it does not change. It's the relationship that does not change is one that is based upon blood. The blood relationship, father to son, mother to child. That's the relationship. You can do anything you want but you can't change who your parents were. You know? You can't change who your parents were. Isaiah 49, 15, this is what God says about his love. He likens it to that kind of relationship. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child, sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. Yes, sometimes there are some bad mothers. But God says, even if the mother doesn't love you I will still love you you can have the worst criminal murderer in the court and they'll ask for uh, someone to speak on his behalf the mother will come up and say yeah I know he, he he was he was bad he did all this stuff but your honor will you please have mercy upon him he's my son <laughs> he's my son he could have been the, a terrible terrible person yet there will be still one person you know what God says my love is greater than that doesn't that give you some hope doesn't that give you some hope that despite how bad we may be God is saying listen I'm still going to be there to say I still love you now whether you respond to that love is a different matter but God still loves you as I said Tuesday night the prodigal son was there the father was there looking for the son. Whether the son responded, it didn't matter. The father still loved him. Still loved him. You know, Brother Myers told, I guess it was a sad, sad story in that it was only the day I think his father died. His father happened to tell him he loved him. As he was walking out the door, his father stopped him and, and started to talk to him. And of course, he just thought it was another day, so he wasn't paying any attention. And he went out and then his father died. He said that's the only time his father ever told him that he loved him. You know, but God is showing us in so many ways, every day, every hour, that he loves us. In so many ways. But we're a bit like him. We, we don't see it or notice it. You know, but if I really start to think of the miracles God has done for me, I know he loves me. But Satan will still come and plant that thought, oh, he doesn't. Because he's not doing what you want him to do. When you want him to do it. And you'll say, oh, he doesn't love you because you asked him for this and he didn't do it. But if you're a good parent, you don't give your child everything they want. Because you can see further. You've had more life experience. You know, it, that thing that they're asking for now may sound good. And it may be pleasurable for them for a season. But... You've seen the result. So Jesus told us through his scripture that he loves us even more than the love of a mother. They say a dangerous, dangerous uh, situation is if you come across a bear with cubs. Because he, the bear might normally ignore you, but if they've got cubs, you look like a threat. Do you understand how God loves us? Even more than any, uh, the closest relationship he could give was as a, of a mother. And he says, even if a mother may forget, yet will I not forget thee. That should give us such hope when we pray. That the relationship that we can claim has nothing to do with us. Think about it. You had no input to who you were born to. And... It doesn't matter what you have done. That cannot change that who you were born to. Do you get that? Think about that. So if that person's a billionaire, it really doesn't matter what you have done. They cannot, they cannot make you not their son either. Because it's, it's born of blood. Born of blood. Now, that doesn't mean... That doesn't mean that that love, as I said Tuesday night, 
One of the sad things in the scripture is about that young rich ruler, right? Bible said he came to Jesus and said, listen, I want to be your disciple. But there was something about him that Jesus saw that he still had some things he wasn't willing to give up. You can't go into a relationship and be tagging your old girlfriend along. I love you. What's she doing here? But I love you. But what, why, are you, why are you still calling her? Why, are you st why is she still in your phone book? Why are you still texting her? In essence, that's what Jesus said to this young man. You want to be my disciple, but you got to go and take care of some things first. You say you love me, but you can't come to Sunday school. You say, I'll die for you. I will go to Africa. I will witness and un walk all day on the streets. But Sunday school? Ooh. <laughs> I'll keep that part in. You see, the thing about that was that's shocking is that it goes on to say that Jesus loved him. That God took a personal interest in this young man and saw the potential, and it says Jesus loved him. We don't even know his name because he loved something else more than God. Because of that, we never know his name. So the fact that we do have a blood relationship doesn't mean we inherit unless we stay at home, unless we get out of the pigsty. As long as he was there, all the father could do was look for him and he could have starved to death the bible said he had to come to his own senses and decide you know what look at my life look at the state of me even the servants live better than me I, i'm gonna get up and arise maybe he'll make me a servant if even if i was a servant i would be doing better but you know the father loved him so much as i said tuesday night because there was a blood relationship it's the one relationship that you can't change. Now, you may not inherit because you, you decide you don't, you're going to be stubborn and stay out in the pigsty, but the relationship is still there. Whenever you decide, whenever you decide to come to your senses, see, Hosea 11.1, 1, in the Old Testament, God pictured Israel as his bride. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. See, he delivered them out of bondage. And you know the story in the Old Testament. All they did was they would be good for a little bit, then they'd rebel. They'd just keep on doing it. But God calls them his son. That shows you the relationship. As long as they're willing to come back and repent, they're still the son. It's the one thing you can't change. A lot of us would like to change it, but we can't. <laughs> Maybe we can't change it. Maybe your family situation wasn't that great, but it is what it is. You know, you cannot change that blood relationship. And so God declared his love to Israel, Deuteronomy 4.37, and because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them and brought thee out in his sight with his mighty power out of Egypt. Again, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. This was a prefiguration of Jesus. Remember when Herod wanted to kill, kill him? They fled to Egypt. But when Herod was dead, God called his son out of Egypt. Because this was a double fulfillment. Deuteronomy 10.15 says, Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them and to choose their seed after them. Then even you above all people, as it is this day, God elevated Israel above all the other people and chose them to be his people. Do you understand? If my people that are called by my name shall seek my face, humble themselves, right, and pray, then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. 
1 John 4, 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God, the biggest one word definition of God is love. 1 John 4, 9, In this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the sacrifice for our sins. Really, love is a bit of a mystery, right? Love is a bit of a mystery. Well, there's a physical attraction. Maybe that's not so much a mystery. But love is a bit of a mystery, how God planned this from the beginning. Right from the beginning, he planned that there should be two becoming one. Genesis 2.21 And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Now women always say, well, we weren't made from the dust, which is true. <laughs> they were made from his side. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. You know, it's a mystery because then man is taken out of woman. Isn't God smart? Isn't he just <laughs> how he does that? Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So the most unified relationship according to scripture, should be between a man and his wife. It shouldn't be between a man and his mother-in-law or, you know. <laughs> it's, it's a man and his wife. That should be the most united relationship. Because he said, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be what? One flesh one flesh and then it goes on to say that this is a mystery there are 13 mysteries called out in the new testament and paul is the one who names and he says this relationship between husband and wife is a mystery how god used it to model his church for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and these two shall be one flesh this is a great mystery but i speak concerning Christ and the church. So the mystery is that the unity of the church with, with Christ is just as the model with the woman. That's why God is a jealous God. You can't be having your girlfriend and your wife. No. No, not going to work. Somebody some years ago Someone years ago came to me, and I may have told you this story. And uh, he, this, this brother was married, and he came to me and he said, Hey, pastor, in the early church, didn't, didn't they have more than one wife? <laughs> and I said, yes. So he said, so it's not really a sin to have more than one wife. And I said, no, that won't work. <laughs> you know what Jesus said that, about that? He said, Moses allowed you to have a bill of, but from the beginning, it was not so. So no, it's not okay. You can't go and have, just because Abraham had, you know, four wives or whatever. No, you can't go and get another wife because you're not happy with the one you've got. That will not work. You know, but God only allowed it to be a one and one relationship that two it didn't say three or four should become one in fact if you look at the old testament the people who had multiple they're the ones that got into trouble all the time it got them into lots of trouble david solomon it's because he had i don't remember like 300 concubines and I think it was 900 or something in the end. I worked out one time he could have seen a different woman every night for three and a half years. 
He couldn't have known on any of them. Now, that is not love. That's not love. That's just flesh. For this cause shall a man, one man, leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be two, shall be one flesh. But God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. In, in other words, that word commendeth means God shows how much he loved us in that there wasn't anything attractive about us. Right? It wasn't because we had a great personality. It wasn't because we could do anything, you know, but while we were yet sinners. So I don't think there is much that God can do further to prove it. And many times I feel that we hurt him because there's nothing worse than when you love someone and they're not even paying attention. They're not, they're ignoring you. They're just not even being receptive to, to what you're saying. That hurts, doesn't it? Like they don't even know you exist. Let's look a little bit deeper. What does love mean? What does love mean? What are the characteristics of love? Well, you can't be in a love relationship and never communicate. That's not love either. Let's look at this. Love means what? Revealing yourself. Love means being intimate, right? So that you're sharing something with the other person that you don't share with everybody. In fact, that you don't share with anybody. Love means being vulnerable. That means you're able to be hurt because you're opening yourself up. You're showing your true, you're not, you're not, you're not hiding who you truly are. So you can't love someone unless they're real. Because what you're loving is not really them. You get what I'm saying? If, if someone is pretending, that's why a lot of marriages fail because... The person you were dating was not the person they really were. They were putting on a front or a face. And then after you married, suddenly they're not the same person anymore. So true love can only work if you're being intimate. That means you're being revealing yourself. You're, you're, you, are, you are committing. And when you commit, it means you can be hurt. So here's my question. Can God be hurt? Yes. By the definition we just said, we, little old me and you, can and we do hurt God. The Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit that you've been seeing. How do, do you realize that you hurt God? Maybe, maybe I hurt God every day. I don't realize it. That we can hurt God. The reason we can hurt God is because he loves us. If he didn't care about us, he couldn't hurt us. Someone walking down the street can, you know, flip you off and cuss you out. How hurt are you going to be about that? You're going to be a year later still being upset about that? But when it's a love issue, man, that takes long time to heal. So we can hurt God because he loves us. That's why we can hurt God is that he fulfills all of those things. He has revealed himself. He has been intimate and he is vulnerable because he loves us. Let me show you in scripture what I'm saying that is true because part of love is revealing. And we see that there's a process. You don't reveal yourself right away. There's a process of getting to know the person, right? There's a, there's a process of getting to know the person. And as you know the person, you, you allow them a little bit more into who you are. And you tell them a little bit more about who you are and where you've been in your life story. And we see that revealed in the scripture. In Exodus 6.3, God tells Moses something. He says, listen, I appeared unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But he's going to tell him something more now. But by my name, Jehovah, the I am, was I not known to them. When you meet somebody, what's the first thing you want to find out? Their name. Can I have you? What, what's your name? I'm so-and-so. What's your name? 
Do you see what's happening here in Scripture? God starts out just doing stuff, but he hasn't revealed his true name. When it come, by the time it comes to Moses to have a relationship with Israel now, he, 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 he reveals something to Moses that's quite astonishing. He says, listen, Abraham and Isaac were my friends. They were my friends, but I want to go beyond friendship. And unto Jacob, they were my friends, but by the name God Almighty, that's all they knew me. They didn't know me as the I am that I am. And I'm about to tell you, since you asked, Moses said, we're going to have this relationship. What's your name? He says, I am that I am. And you know, this is the beginning of God revealing himself progressively so that he can have a love relationship with Israel. And he reveals, he says, listen, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we were friends, but they didn't know me by this name. See, I don't know many of your middle names, <laughs> but I would hope you know her middle name, right? <laughs> I would hope that, that husband and wife know. Now, we may know your first names, but your middle names we may not know because that's not, not common. Jesus, God here is revealing, so to speak, his middle name. He says, but by my name, Jehovah, was I not known. But I'm going to reveal something to you because I want to go beyond friendship, Moses. I want to go beyond friendship. I want to get into a different level of relationship. Exodus 3.13, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, they shall say to me, What is your name? What shall I say unto them? You know what, Moses? I'm going to tell you something that not everyone else knows. Right? Like, probably none of you know my middle name. Well, <laughs> Sister Mary. <laughs> Sister Mary has been here a long time, and maybe Sister Deb does too. See, but I'm going to tell you something, see, because I want to go beyond friendship. My middle name is Richard. Now you know something you didn't know before. That's what God revealed to Moses. He says, my middle name is I am that I am. Not only am I God Almighty, but I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say. See, what God was doing here, he was starting a relationship that went beyond just being friends. I am that I, that when you start a relation, that's, that's what you start to, t my, my first name, then you start talking and where do you work, where you were born, and you start telling your life, you get to know them. That's what God was doing here because he wanted a relationship with Israel who he had created. And then something else happens because when you have that relationship, eventually there is an intimacy that happens. And that happens too. Let's look at that. Exodus 33, 18. And Moses said, listen, I want to see your glory. <laughs> and, and God says, you know what? You can't really see it and live, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reveal a little bit more of myself to you. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all of my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, thou cannot see my face for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me. Thou shalt stand upon a rock. See, the only way we can be intimate with God is through Jesus Christ. Paul in the New Testament said that rock that followed them was Jesus Christ. That's how we can see his glory. It's through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, no man cometh to the Father but by me. That's why we have to be baptized in Jesus' name. The only way we can get truly intimate with God where he will reveal himself is through Christ. So in the Old Testament, that was modeled by this rock. God said, listen, I'm going to show you a place and I want you to stand on that rock. 
and thou shalt stand upon the rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover thee. I taught about that, that every creature God has created has to have a covering to come near him. But he's going to cover us. That's what he does today with his Holy Spirit so that we can be intimate with him. Otherwise, the Bible says if you have not his spirit, you're none of his. Because that is the beginning of the blood relationship. And come to pass that while my glory passeth by that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand and thou shalt see my back parts but my face shall not be seen. God let him have a glimpse. God let him have a, You see, when we're in love, eventually there's going to be a time when the, the love becomes intimate. The intimate part is when we receive the spirit. That's the beginning of God bringing us back into intimacy with him. And there's nothing wrong with that. For a marriage to be a fully cons consummated marriage, there's going to have to be a part of intimacy. Here's Paul in the New Testament speaking about that. Philippians 3.8. He's, he's in prison in Rome and it's near the end of his life. And he's writing to the church of the uh, Philippians. He says, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. When I look back on my life, I gave up having a family. I gave up having a marriage relationship. I gave up having children. I gave up a career. But I don't care about any of that. I count all of that as loss. Why? Because I'm in love with Christ. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. He was so in love with Christ. And here's what his goal was, to be found in him. That brings us back to what happened to Moses. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock so that my intimacy can be revealed. Paul is saying, that's what I want. I want to be intimate with Christ. I want to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, not having uh, um, uh, a, a list of good things that I have done because none of them amount to a hill of beans. I killed Christians. I had Stephen stoned to death. I don't want any of my deeds accounted for. I want to be found in him covered with his righteousness. Do you understand? God is going to provide the wedding garment. Remember the parable? Remember the parable? He provided the wedding garment. Our wedding garment wasn't pretty enough, wasn't good enough. We can't come to the wedding with our stuff. He said, I'm going to provide the wedding garment. And they found some guy in there and he wasn't with the wedding. Friend, how did you get in here without the wedding garment? Do you understand to be intimate with God? We he's going to provide the covering. He said that I might be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, which is of a bunch of rules. Thou shall not do this, thou shalt do this. Paul said, as far as the law is concerned, I was blameless. I kept the Sabbath, you know, as soon as the sun set, I was in Sabbath mode. And I kept all the, I gave all my tithes. I did everything perfectly. I did, as far as the law, I was blameless. A Pharisee of the Pharisee. And yet, that amounts to nothing because he goes on to say, that's trying to put my own righteousness that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Here is the righteousness when we believe that God loves us and that we're covered through his covering. That's what God did in, in, in symbol for Moses. He said, listen, you want to see me. You're going to have to stand on this rock. I'm going to put a cleft in the rock and I'm going to hide you in the rock. Then I'm going to cover you. And as I pass by, then I'm going to remove my covering so you can glimpse a little bit of me. I'm going to start to show you my intimacy. So first he told him his name. I'm going to reveal my middle name to you. My friends, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew me as God Almighty. Now I'm going to give you my middle name. See, when you know a middle name, that means you, you have some deeper relationship than just, you know, first and last name. Not many people know middle names. 
And so this is what God was doing. He was showing his love and the process of love by revealing himself and then being intimate. So Paul says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might obtain the resurrection of the dead. What Paul is saying, listen, I too want intimacy. It's a two-way street. Right? It's not just the, the one person. It's got to be both. And Paul is saying, listen, it's not as if I've already attained this. I have not. Either we're already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend. That means grab hold of that for which I am also apprehended. Christ is grabbing hold of me. I want to return and grab hold of him. I want to embrace, a mutual embrace. Therefore, verse 14, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. See, God wants intimacy with us, but we also have to want intimacy with him. Because otherwise, there's rejection. Rejection. Bible says he was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. So, first he started to give him his name, then he revealed himself, as I said, through the rock. Hebrews 11.24 is an amazing scripture. It's an amazing scripture. See if you can see why it's an amazing scripture. 24 to 26. Let me read it. By faith... When he had come to years, this is Moses, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Because that was a, not a true blood relationship. Choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of of the reward. The reward he's speaking about was not seen by natural, it was a reward that's seen only through faith. Now, what's the astonishing thing about those verses? What should jump out at you and say, wow? When did Moses meet Christ? Esteeming the reproach of Christ. Don't you see what that's saying? The person who said, I am that I am. The person who said, my friends, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew me as almighty God is Jesus Christ. Esteeming the reproach, he gave up the throne of Pharaoh. Esteeming the reproach greater because of Jesus Christ because he stood upon the rock Paul says in the New Testament the rock that followed them the rock that did the water the rock that poured out water the rock that he struck twice was Christ so Moses met Jesus Christ in fact they all did because Jesus in John 8 44 said, before Abraham was, isn't that his middle name? Isn't that the middle name that he told Moses? Okay. Isn't that amazing? The rock is revealed. Amen. So true love is fulfilled not only in intimacy and in revealing, but that is in really listening. If your partner's talking to you and you're not listening, what you're really saying subconsciously is, I don't value what they're saying. You know, talking past each other. Just want them to finish so you can say your part. Right? But if you love someone, you're going to hang upon every word. <laughs> Let me put this in. Who wrote a letter, not an email, a real letter? When last did you write a real letter? Some of you are got a few decades. <laughs> When was the last time you wrote a real, genuine, mail-it letter? Nobody? <laughs> All right, Sister Hannah, how long ago was that? A month ago. That's amazing. That's amazing. I haven't wrote a, 
a real, yeah, Sister Brownie writes real letters. But I don't think I've written a real hand letter since I was dating her. <laughs> and I remember because that was before internet and all of that. I would reread those letters and reread those letters and go over every little word and everything, right? It's love, yes. <laughs> You see, because all her words were important. Now, as I've gotten older, maybe I'm not as <laughs> listening as much as I should. She's looking at me like that. I still do listen in the end. In the end, I listen. She may have to repeat it a little bit more than at the beginning, but I, I do listen. I think. I think I listen. She gets what she wants in the end. <laughs> in the end. Amen. So true love means we respect what the other person is saying. Because I don't think you can have love without respect. Can you? You can't have love without respect. So true love is fulfilled in heeding, in listening to learn the other person. Because if you're not listening to what they're saying, you're not going to understand them. You're not going to really know who they are. Numbers 14, 19 says, Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people. Here's Moses now speaking to God on behalf of Israel. He's saying, because they just messed up. According unto the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt, even until now. And guess what? Because the Lord loved Israel, he listened. And the Lord said, I have pardoned. How? According to thy word. So when you're in love, what the other person says should have an effect on you. It should change your thinking to some extent, right? At least sometime, right? At least some. This shows that it's a two-way street. That because God loves you, guess what? He's going to listen to you. He is going to listen to you. That's why our prayers can be affected because God loves us. He has promised. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because these men which have seen my glory and my miracles. See what happened here? They hurt God, and he was upset. But when you love someone, you may be grumpy for a day or two, but you'll get over it. Especially if they say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. It was a mistake. I didn't even realize I was hurting you. Right? And so we may hurt God, but when we confess, the Bible says he is faithful to forgive us. See, this is what Jesus said in Luke 12, uh, 12 48. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. But for unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more. So God's going to require a lot from me. See, when there is love, as I said, we will listen. There will be intimacy. There will be revelation. There will be opening to being hurt. That's why love can be painful. Love can be painful. But eventually, you can so hurt that person that it kills love. You can kill love by just repeatedly stabbing at that person's heart. Eventually, it scars over. Hebrews 6, 4 says this, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good power, the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So what's this saying? If God has opened himself up to you and given you his spirit, right, been made partaker of the heavenly gift, and have tasted the good word of God, it is possible for you to hurt God so much by repeatedly, repeatedly cheating, so to speak. 
that you kill the marriage. Right? What, what, what killed, what under the, in the New Testament even killed the marriage? Adultery. If we repeatedly, repeatedly, after we've been married to Christ, that means truly filled with the Spirit. It's not a mat matter of just thoughtlessness or care. You, you have to deliberately do this. You know, I'm deliberately going to hurt you. I'm going to deliberately uh, let you see me with my other partner so that you know I don't love you anymore. That's what I'm talking about. It's not a, a sin, just sinning or something. like. It's when you deliberately go out your way to crucify him afresh. The crucifixion of Christ was not an accident. It wasn't like they accidentally put some nails in. No, that was not an accident. To crucify Christ, you have to go get the nails. You have to build a cross. You have to nail him. One. That's, that's what he's talking about. So it's if you deliberately say, I am out of this marriage. I hate you, God. I don't, I, and, 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 and not even, it's with premeditation, so to speak. That's what this is talking about. Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God. Like you can kill somebody accidentally, right? You can drop something out a window and you didn't know someone was there and they die. That's an accident. But crucifixion is not an accident. That's what it's speaking about. You, God will keep loving you. You may drop a pot on his head. You may uh, step on his toe. But when you deliberately just say, I choose to reject you. I know you love me, but I don't love you. That's what we're talking about. That's what happened in the day of Noah. They willingly became ignorant. The Bible said that they chose to serve the creature rather than the creator. The word, most important word that is there, chose. Wasn't an accident. We know you're God, but we don't love you. So it is possible to kill that relationship. 1 John 5.16 if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. We can hurt God so much that it is a sin unto death. John was explaining the difference between that kind and just regular sin. All unrighteousness is sin. But there is also a sin, and, and there is sin not unto death. He's saying, not every sin is the sin unto death. You have to be out of your way deliberately writing a bill of divorcement and saying, I don't want you anymore in my life, God. God will not withdraw. The father stood there every day. Even though the son said, give me all my money, I want to go. I don't want to be at the house. But he didn't say, I don't want to be your son. And when he came back, he said, please just make me a servant. And the fact that he came back was ma what made the difference. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. This is part one of God's love. I hope you've been blessed. Amen. Hope you've been blessed. And what, what we're talking about today is intimacy, revelation, vulnerability, Amen. And listening. But that doesn't just go on God's part. That's also for us. We have to fulfill that too. We have to be ready to be intimate with God. Like Paul said, listen, I could have done all these things with my life. I gave all of that up. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not whining about it. I would do even more. Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul said, I just count that as throwaway. I don't care. I'd, I'd do that again. I'd do that three times just to be intimate with God. Amen. When we have that desire, that kind of love, and that determination, that's when God will be intimate with us, and then we'll be truly one. He says, if my words abide in you and, and, and you abide in me, then, then you can ask. It's that kind of intimacy that God truly wants with us. And when we get to that intimacy, then we'll see a change because love, my father used to say, love wins love. Amen. Amen. Love wins love. Amen. 
God wants to look down on us and say, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. And you know what it takes to get him to say that? Just love him. Just trust him. Just believe him. Hallelujah. If you could bow your hearts and say, Father, we just thank you that you've given us the opportunity, Lord, to be once again in your service on a Sunday morning, to hear your word, Lord God. Oh, Lord, to help it to find good soil, to meditate upon your goodness and your grace and your love. Lord, help us to return that love, that in intimacy, Lord. Help us to draw closer to you. Help us to find you, Lord God, in every aspect of our lives. Lord Jesus, we continue to ask you to continue to bless our second service. Let the word go forth. Let our worship ascend to the throne room, Lord God. Lord, you know what each of us needs, Lord God. You know what each of us are going through. Lord, I pray, oh God, that you just come in like, like a flood, Lord God, into our hearts. Lord, let us experience that love, Lord God, that warmth of knowing that you are looking down upon us right now and you are saying, this is my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. Lord, I thank you, hallelujah, for what you have done in our lives. And I praise you and I give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Give God a praise offering. Amen. Amen.